talks here at 1030 this morning. So it's going to be a lot, a lot of fun. So Zechariah chapter 12, turn there. Uh, Sozo is a special place. Oftentimes during the week, I talk to people who walk in for the first time and they just say, you know, there's something different about this place. I sense something different about this location. And, and part of me wants to automatically go to the Jesus point of conversation at that time. But I, I, but I, uh, you know, I, I abstain from that. But I uh, get to know them, and um, a, lot of, a lot of the fun customers we have are people that l- work in the plaza who come in for coffee all the time, and so we get people from the, the pizza restaurant, from Sweetie's Candy next door. And um, So one of my staff uh, told me th- the other day that uh, one, of the, uh, one of the people that live, works in the plaza came in, and uh, she had come in numerous times before, and um, she ordered her drink, and she said to the barista, can I, can I ask you a question? And uh, so the barista was like, sure. And she kind of leaned in a little bit like this is going to be like a secret conversation, right? So she proceeded to ask the barista this question. You guys are always so happy here. You guys are always so happy. Do you guys smoke weed? (laughs) And, uh, you know, the answer was no. As far as you guys know, uh, <laughs> no, but it was cool to have somebody just be able to go like, you know what, I, I see something, I, I'm acknowledging something, and uh, I don't know what makes you guys so cheerful and so happy. Is it pot? I don't know. Is that the answer? And, uh, you know, if, if only we as believers in Christ could just have those opportunities to tell people why, why we're so happy, why, why we're so joyous, why we're so, you know, just pleased. Not that everything's right. You know, none of, the, none of the staff, not everyone knows Jesus that's on staff at Sozo, but, you know, there's a general spirit that we try to create here that we're family and that, you know, we get to live life and life is not perfect and life doesn't come without trials and difficulties, but it's, it's, it's a matter of perspective, isn't it? That we all go through difficult times and, boy, sometimes we just need to get, to, to have our heads lifted, to have our hearts lifted, to, to realize that there are greater things uh, that are taking place than we would ever realize, and that there's a God that can be trusted in it all. And, and that's where Zechariah comes in, along with all the other minor prophets that we've been looking at, is that there's a God who, uh, who wants to instill hope in the hearts of his people. That there's a God who says, no matter what may be going on around you, there's greater work going on within you. You know, it's not, it's not our distance from danger uh, or difficulties that's going to make us happy. It's our nearness to God that's going to bring us joy. And so we turn to Zechariah. If you would, turn in your Bibles. We're going to finish Zechariah today. And uh, what a journey it's been. I didn't think we would spend five weeks just in Zechariah. But, you know, what God just said, you, just, you cannot rush through this prophet's message. Uh, the portraits of Jesus we've seen since chapter 1. Uh, we're going to conclude today with three more portraits of Christ. And that's what all the prophets do. They point to Jesus. They remind us that there's, there's hope. We can have confidence in the promises of God. And no matter what may be going on in your world, there's a God who's got things in control and He can be trusted. And last week, if you remember, boy, we saw the prophecies that were fulfilled in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Today we're going to continue on that theme as we look at Zechariah 12, 13, and 14. And what we're going to see this morning are three portraits of Jesus. We're going to see Jesus as the wounded one. We're going to see Jesus as the cleansing one. And lastly, we're going to see Jesus as the reigning one. Jesus as the cleansing one. Jesus as the the wounded one, the cleansing one, and the reigning one. And I'm getting a music stand here so I can put my Bible up. Zechariah 12, you guys there? So check this out. To, to instill confidence in the heart of, of God's people, we turn to Zechariah 12, and he says, The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel thus declares the Lord. Notice how he starts out this section here. The Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundations of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Stop right there. I love how Zechariah goes into this section reminding us of how powerful God is. Don't we sometimes forget 
that God is powerful? Do we not forget that God is sovereign? And Zechariah just wants to remind us that, hey, the God who loves you, the God that you are, are loving, he's the same one who stretched out the heavens, he laid the foundation of the earth, and he formed your spirit within you. So not only can we see in creation God's power on display, but he reminds us that we are also created by this magnificent, powerful, sovereign God. And it's almost like he's saying, consider creation, but stop and consider the greatest of God's creation, you as human beings. The Bible says you as men and women are the apex of God's creation. Yeah, the stars are magnificent, the the forests are wonderful, the mountains are majestic, but there's no more part of creation that means more to God than you. He has formed your spirit within you, which, number one, ought to give us a sense of, wow, my life has meaning, I am significant. But before you can even tap in, to the meaning and significance that God has wired you with, I think what Zechariah is ultimately getting to when he mentions the spirit of man is your accountability to him. See, we try to live lives that are not accountable to God. And Zechariah has been warning the people of God because they've made the mistake of trusting themselves. They've made the mistake of getting their eyes off of of God. They've made the mistake of just trying to live life according to their own rules, and they've neglected God. That's why he's brought severe discipline into their lives. He once again reminds us that we are accountable to him. And can I I tell you something that's never going to work? You never are going to get God on your side. We think if, if this relationship with God's going to work, he's got to come my way. And that's where I say, no way will Yahweh come to your side. A relationship with God always requires you getting on his side. He has formed your spirit within you, and he has designed you to have a relationship with him, and the relationship with him is always, write this down, on his terms. You ever been stuck in a place where you just feel like, I just can't get God on my side? You need to surrender that one. You need to give up on that one. God will never come to your side. It always starts with Him being the Lord, the sovereign ruler, the King. Why? Because He has created you. You follow the ways of His creation order. You do what He wants you to do. He has formed your spirit within you so that you can get on His side. And so Zechariah starts this section by reminding us that you are important, you have significance, you have purpose, but the only way you're going to experience life the way God designed it is when you understand your accountability to him. And then Zechariah goes into talking about the enemies that surround us. There's so many factors in this world that are, that are set up against us, that are trying to destroy us. And God wants you to know the first point under, under the wounded one, Jesus, is this. The, the, the fact that God's going to conquer our enemies. That you have nothing to fear because when you're on his side, you're on the winning side. When you're on his side, you're on the side of, of eternal strength. You have a God who's not passive when it comes to defending you. You have a God who's going to vindicate every wrong done against you. He's a God who will make right every wrong. He's a God who believes in justice because he is just. And you need to know that God is going to conquer your enemies. You don't need to do this. He will fight for you. And that's what Zechariah is going to describe here. Verse 2, Behold, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And when the siege against Jerusalem and against Judah, and it will come about, notice this in verse 3, that if anyone comes up against you, it will be like lifting a heavy rock. You are a heavy stone, and they will be injured in trying to hurt you. It's cool how God gives us this imagery in Zechariah that if anyone comes up against you, God's going to have to take issue with that. Now, we may not experience that right away. We may not experience that in our timetable, but God has promised to conquer our enemies. Is that not good news or what? The battle belongs to the Lord. Let him fight the battles that he needs to fight, and we remain a trusting people in him. 
So God has promised to conquer our enemies. He talks about this through verse 9. And then we come to verse 10. And this is where I want to spend a few minutes. Because while it is okay to think about God conquering our enemies, while it is okay to think about God correcting every wrong, the greatest area that God must conquer are our hearts. And this is the second point in your notes. See, Jesus is the wounded one who, according to Isaiah chapter 50, 53, bore our sins upon himself, was beaten, was whipped. He was wounded for our transgressions, for our sins. And you know what? We need to keep this in perspective. He did it not so he could conquer our enemies. He did it first so he could conquer our hearts. He was wounded for us so that we could understand what it means to be a broken people before him and then experience the ultimate healing that he has for us. Why does God need to break us? He breaks us because of our sin, our rebellion, and our disobedience. Notice verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Circle those words, grace and supplication. I'm going to unpack that here in a moment. So that when they look on me whom they have pierced, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Now, Zechariah is writing 500 years before the time of Christ. Now, what's amazing is Zechariah writes in a future tense, they will look on me whom they have pierced. Looking is future, but the pierced is past tense. So what Zechariah is seeing is that the me being God himself, being pierced at some future time of some event that actually was planned in the past. Now, stop right there. Can you see the fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 at some point in in history? See, the only way for God to be pierced is that he had to become human. And to become human, he had to be wounded, hence the piercing. Did you know in John chapter 19, when Jesus hung on the cross, there was a Roman soldier right by him, and he stabbed Jesus' side with a spear. And John says in chapter 19, at that moment, the words of Zechariah 12 were fulfilled. They will look on me, God, whom they have pierced, and they will mourn. Now think about the gravity, the weight of what Zechariah is describing here. In order to conquer our hearts, There must be brokenness. There must be a weeping. There must be a grieving so deep. It's as if you lost your only child. But yet, there is no amount of weeping that can correct our hard-heartedness. There's no amount of grieving that can ever make you right with God. And so God says... You will become a broken people, but I'm not going to leave you in that brokenness. I'm going to tell you that the weight of guilt and the weight of shame, there's an answer. And that answer is you can have freedom through the forgiveness that I'm going to extend to you. So while mourning lasts and it's a, a hurtful time, you're feeling the weight of your sin deeply, there's, there's a way out. Isn't that good news to know that we're not constantly under the hands of God's guilt and shame that he has given us a path to freedom and the path of freedom is this that you look on him who you have pierced and you will mourn you will be broken but you need to know that you will not stay in that brokenness that there is liberation for all who believe in the sacrifice of the one who is to come and we 2,000 years after Jesus look back and sit there and go Thank you, God, for giving us Jesus. And there's the answer, because in Acts chapter 2, I believe there is a partial fulfillment of verse 10 here in Zechariah, where Acts 2, all the people gather in Jerusalem for for the celebration of Pentecost, this holy day. Jews have gathered, 
and Peter gets up and lifts Jesus up. And all of a sudden, people look upon Jesus and they are broken and they are saved. Thousands come to know Jesus because of their brokenness. Why? Because Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw men and women to myself. See, in order for God to do a mighty work in this world, he first has to do a mighty work on your hearts. That I must recognize my sin, I must understand my guilt, and I must understand that I must become broken because he's a holy God and I'm not holy. Amen? We're not perfect, but he is perfect. But in order to have a relationship with us, we must look on him and be broken And that brokenness ultimately leads to healing. Because God promises all you who come to me, who are burdened and heavy laden, according to Matthew chapter 11, you will find rest. Can we just take a collective deep breath right now? Don't we want rest? Because there is no rest from the person who's trying to run from their sin. There's no rest for the person who's trying to escape the guilt because there's nowhere you can go to escape it because it has nothing to do with the circumstances around you. It has to do with your conscience. And how many of you just this week were having a tough time with your conscience? Just raise your hand. A few of you. Our consciences weigh heavy on us. And God gave us our consciences to remind us that we are not accountable to ourselves. We're accountable to Him. And so we will look on Him that we have pierced and we will mourn but we know that mourning only lasts for a moment we can be healed through christ this is the beauty of the gospel of jesus christ that there is hope that there's an answer and that's why jesus says exalt me lift me up and i will draw men and women to myself you see this brokenness throughout scripture that there's this idea that grace has been given and supplication has been given. You know what these two words mean here in verse 10? The spirit of grace is given for you to initially believe and the the spirit of supplication is given so that once you believe, you have a never-ending access to God to continue to be cleansed because once you come to know Jesus, it doesn't mean you live your life perfectly. How many of you have come to know Jesus but still make mistakes? How many of you, good, every one of you that didn't raise your hand, you're a liar, but you're still welcome here, all right? Every single one of us, even though we have found forgiveness in Christ, we understand that we can continue to mess up. We continue to make mistakes. We continue to sin. And this is where the spirit of supplication maintains the relationship that God says to me, you're still going to get dirty, but you can come to me and be cleansed as many times as you need to be. Because once you come to know Jesus through the spirit of grace, You're positionally perfect in Him and there's nothing you could ever do to sin your way out of God's grace. But practically, we mess up. And this is where supplication comes in, where we continue to go, God, forgive me. And He says, I will forgive you. Every time you confess your sins, I will forgive you. 1 John 1, 9. A great promise for every single one of us in this room today. So God conquers our enemies, but first He wants to conquer our hearts and we thank God for His faithful love for us. But I'm going to tell you something too. That this morning can also be true in the ultimate sense of when Christ comes back. Because one thing we affirm is that Jesus is coming back. And there will come a day when people have rebelled themselves out of the kingdom of God. And they will look on Jesus. They will see his wounds. And they will mourn. But it's not a mourning that will lead to eternal life. It's a mourning that will lead to eternal condemnation because they will look on him and everything that they despised, everything they dismissed will ultimately be fulfilled before their very eyes and they will be proved to be wrong in their unbelief. Until then, let us lift up Christ Jesus. Let us, uh, let us trust God to draw all people to him and remind every single person that there is no sin so great that God's love can't conquer. Amen? That there are people out there who, f- who are so self-condemning and so full of self-hate that they think no one, not even God, could love them. And may we be the messengers of a hope that says God can love anybody. And He has. I'm looking at faces right now. Some of you don't deserve it. None of us deserve it. But yet He's given to us anyways. Amen? 
So Christ was wounded so that we could be set free. He was wounded so that we can be saved. This is why Zechariah 12, verse 10, is so critical. And then we go to chapter 13, verse 1. And what does the wounding of Christ do for us? It cleanses us. He is the cleansing one. See, look at verse 1. On that day, a fountain will be open for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for impurity. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And all you guilty sinners who plunge beneath that flood will what? Lose all their guilty stains. That's old school music right there, just so you guys just ne- are aware of it. Some of you are like, what is he even talking about? A hymn that was written some time ago where this guy came to this passage and he says, i got to write a song about that. There's a fountain that has been opened up and it's a perennial fountain. What does perennial mean? Perpetual. Eternal. And there's this fountain that God opens up and all who are cleansed by this fountain, are cleansed of their sin and their impurity. Can I ask you a question? This is Bible 101. True or false, when you accept the wounded one Jesus as your Lord and Savior, He cleanses you of 50% of your sinful stain. False. False. Good. You guys, okay, you passed. True or false, when you are plunged beneath the cleansing flood of Jesus' salvation, you are cleansed of 100% of your sin. True or false? You guys passed. Good job. All right. You're almost seminarians. You're almost there. All right. There's hope for all of you. The beauty of this passage is right in sync with what the Bible says. Is when God forgives you, He forgives you completely. When he forgives you, he forgives you of all your sin. You stand righteous before him because of Christ. You stand perfect before him because of Christ. And God will no longer hold you guilty for sin that he is excused from your account. Because Jesus has taken your sin upon himself. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for you. And now we need to walk in this freedom. You've been cleansed. And we have been cleansed from two things I want to point out in this chapter. Number one, you're cleansed from sin and you're cleansed from fear. That that fountain that's been opened through the perfect sacrifice of the holy priest, the one and only priest that we need to go to, Jesus Christ, you have been cleansed from sin. And if you put your trust in Him, if you've accepted Him and the free gift of eternal life that He offers, God says, your sinful account has now been paid in full. Some price you could never pay, but one price He did pay. You are now not guilty in Christ because of His obedience on your behalf. And not only that, you want to know the bonus? is Not only has God excused you of your sin, He's taken away your sin, He's given you a gift. The righteousness of Jesus. Is that not awesome? So now, not only has he removed the power of sin from your life, he has now given you the ability to live a life for his glory and his honor. You are not left without an owner's manual. You are not left without power. You are not left without direction. You are left with the righteousness of Jesus. And God says, now walk in the manner worthy of Christ Jesus. You are cleansed from sin. And don't let the enemy creep in and tell you you're something you're not. This is why our identity in Christ is so critical. That's why we have talks like this. To remind you of who you are in Jesus. Who are you in Jesus? I'm the one Jesus loves. I'm the one Jesus has forgiven. I'm the one Jesus died for. I'm the one Jesus has, been, has set free. I'm the one Jesus is doing a perfect work in. And I keep reminding myself of that. And when I find myself powerless to do the things God wants me to do, he reminds me he's given me the spirit of power, not of fear or intimidation, but the spirit of power to do what glorifies him. Amen? Which brings us to the second point. He, con- he conquers 
the, the power of fear in our lives. He cleanses us from fear. Fear has no place in a believer's life. Now, there is a healthy fear that Proverbs 1, 7 talks about where the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. But there's a fear that shouldn't be present in any believer's life that debilitates us. Do you know that fear by which I speak? The fear that is self-shaming and self-condemning. The fear that God's not in control. The fear that God does not care. And I just sit there and go, point to the cross. Does he not care? He's done the greatest thing for us by sending his son to die on our behalf. And Romans 8 says, if God saves you, how could you doubt that he's not going to do all other things for your life, for your benefit, for your good? If God is for us, who can be against us? Tell me that. And so there's no fear because in verse 7 of chapter 13, look at what it says. Back up verse 6. And one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? And he will say, those are the wounds which I found uh, and I, I got in the house of my friends. Verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man my associate. Declares the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered. And I will turn my hand against the little ones. And it will come about in that land, declares the Lord, that two parts of it will be cut off and perish, but a third of it will be left. And I will bring that third part through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined, and I will test them as gold is tested. And they will call on my name, and I will answer them. And, they, and I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. See, here's why you need to be cleansed of fear. There came a moment, Matthew chapter 26, when they came to arrest Christ. And the shepherd was struck. And you know what happened to the sheep? They scattered. Those disciples ran in 20 different directions. 12. We'll call it 12. There's 12 disciples, right? You failed Bible 101. I'm sorry, you guys. They were scattered. Jesus said this would happen. Zechariah said this would happen. But the shepherd was struck. The sheep were scattered. And these men, the women that were disciples at the time, they were fearful because they didn't know what was going to happen to them. And yet, what did Jesus say? He, He predicted these things would happen. But they all come back together, right? They all come together in this room. And all of a sudden, the risen Christ appears to them and says what? Fear not. The plan that I told you guys about, it's, it's unfolding, it's happening. You have nothing to fear. And all of a sudden, when they see the risen Christ, there is a courage that wells up within them that can't be described. And they go out and they start proclaiming the message of Jesus. And thousands are coming to know Jesus because these are not men and women living in fear and intimidation anymore. These are men and women who are coming out into the public declaring the lordship of Christ. And thousands are coming to Jesus. And this is what happens when God cleanses our hearts from this earthly fear is that you need to understand you can live with courage and you can live with power. That God has not given you the spirit of fear or timidity but he's given you the spirit of power, according to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And this is good to know because we get fearful when we question God's ways in our lives. The disciples were scattered and they're they're confused about God. Have you ever grown fearful because you don't know how to trust God through difficult moments that you're going through? See, notice that when the scattering of the shepherd happens and and life events start happening, it says two-thirds of people will fall away, but there's a third. There's this minority group. And I'm going to tell you, God has a master way of working with minorities, amen? He, He does not sit there and go, hey, what does popular opinion tell you? What is the world saying? You know what? You have to realize that if you're going to follow Christ, you're going to be in the minority. You need to know if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to be in the minority, and all the more to be confident and courageous that christ is the way and he says what's going to happen to that third is i'm going to test them i'm going to purify them as silver is tested as gold is purified and i'm going to bring them through difficulties but i'm going to do it because i love them i'm going to prove the strength of their faith 
But all along, notice the song that's exchanged between God and his people. He's going to sing over us, you're to my people, and we're going to declare to him, you are my God. See, God never promises you a life free from trials. Amen? I know, two of you answered. I know, that's a hard thing to say amen to. God, we wish we could just sign up with Jesus. He's like, hey, it's easy street here on out, baby. It's easy street. But yet Jesus says, if they, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If what they did to me was out of their hatred and their unaccountability to God, they're going to do the same to you. Even Paul in Colossians chapter 1. You want to read a moving passage? Colossians chapter 1. He says, my life is being filled up with the afflictions of Christ. Meaning, he is bearing in his body the hatred the world has towards Jesus. And because Jesus isn't here, he's going to be the recipient of the hatred. Do you guys think you're going to get off scot-free? Do you guys think you're immune to them? But the promise is this, that even when you go through trials, it's not the distance from danger that matters. It's the nearness of your God who whispers to you, you are my people. And we cry out to him, you're my God. There's no reason to doubt his love. There's no reason to doubt his commitment. And this is when we pray, God, raise up that spirit of courage in me. Help me not see what's seen. Help me to see what's unseen. Help me remember the words of 2 Corinthians 4, where he says, though the outer man is decaying, the inner man is being renewed day by day. That you have not left me out in the wilderness to wander and to be hopeless, but you have, you have a plan for my life. And somehow you're gonna, you can be trusted through it all. The other day I'm watching Seabiscuit with my kids. You guys remember Seabiscuit? If you've never, who's never seen Seabiscuit? Raise your hands. Okay, you can be forgiven, you can be forgiven, you can be forgiven. Seabiscuit is, is perhaps one of the most amazing movies that communicate this truth. That just because a life is broken doesn't mean you throw it away. What a magnificent truth we need to understand. My kids were watching this movie, right? And there's this horse that that they want to get rid of. There's this rider that they want to get rid of. And the message of the movie is find people that are going to believe in you. Find people that are going to believe in you. And you know what? Just because you're banged up a little bit doesn't mean you're to be put out to pasture. Just because you've been bruised and you've been wounded doesn't mean that you are useless. And boy, how true is this of the love of God towards people? Because guess what? We're all beat up. We're all bruised. We're all damaged goods. Amen? And yet there's a God who says, just because you've been through what you've been through, Never discount your purpose. Never discount your significance. Never discount your value. Because he came for such people as us. And looking at us, we're a collective mess, amen? But praise God that we're a collective mess that celebrate the grace of God. Who says, I will cleanse you of sin. I will cleanse you of fear. And even though there may be circumstances in life that don't make sense, when you know God and you know His nearness, there is nothing that will stop you because He believes in you. Amen? Rent Seabiscuit this week. This is the the pastor's movie recommendation of the week. We need more stories like that. You're a story of God's redeeming love. Amen? Last point. Jesus is the reigning one. And this is where Zechariah points us to this unstoppable future that God has for his people. That there is coming a day of celebration and there is coming a day of consummation. The celebration has to do with what? It has to do with the fact that God reigns and the consummation is this of God's relationship. We go to chapter 14. And it's a picture of the future for God's people. 
And there's a lot of imagery here that I don't want to go into, but I will tell you as I wipe my nose. Excuse me. This is one of the downsides of being an emotional person. Chapter 14 says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. Meaning God will reward those who are his people who suffer unjustly. There's going to become a day when God will make right, right every wrong. He says, for I will gather the nations. I'm going to gather them and the Lord's going to go forth and fight against those nations, verse 3, as when he fights on the day of battle. Can I just tell you, we're going to have the best seats for this fight. Right? This is not something DirecTV is going to carry. You're going to have to pay a $100 subscription to watch or, or things like that. This is going to be a battle where you sit back as God's people and go, you kick butt, God. You can say that. You guys know that, right? You can say kick butt, God. He will make right every wrong. And on that day, he will stand on the Mount of Olives. He will be there on the Mount of Olives. Why this is important is because the Mount of Olives is the place in Acts chapter 1 where Jesus left the disciples to go into heaven. And he's going to come back to that very spot. Did he not say to those guys, right? Why are you looking up at the sky? Right? Like, I'm coming back. Like I promised I would. You just get busy. Start doing the work I've commanded you to do. I'm going to come back. He's going to come back to this place. And he says, people are going to flee and people are going to run. And it says in verse 9, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. And that day the Lord will be the only one and his name the only one. See, we need to understand that God reigns now, but there is a future reign of God that will be inescapable for all people. That there will be one day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord, according to Philippians chapter 2. See, we need to realize that on this final day, there will be no more atheists, there will be no more agnostics, There will be no more unbelieving or dismissing of God or Jesus or the Bible or the truth. You know what? You know what? It breaks my heart is watching these videos of people who don't agree with somebody who's speaking at their commencement address. And as soon as that person gets up and does the commencement address, they stand up and walk out. They did it with Obama. They do it with Trump. And I just sit there. Number one, I go, what a bunch of spoiled brats who have always gotten things their own way. And when things didn't work out the way they wanted to, they're just going to get out and throw a little pity party. Well, good for you. Have fun crying in your own little sorrow and mourning, right? You don't have to agree with the person, but I tell you what, what I learned is you respect the position. Amen? Boys and girls with golden spoons in their mouth, thinking that life's always going to deliver what they want. They're in for a rude awakening because they're the same people that are going to get married, and as soon as their spouse doesn't do what they want, they're out. They find a job, the boss doesn't do what they want, they're gone. And they will live this endless cycle of thinking that life is all about them being served. That's my little soapbox. But I think about this because ultimately, there's a lordship issue in every heart that has ever been born in this world. And there's a God who speaks to our consciences and says, you are not God. I am, follow me. You are not God, I am, obey me. You are not God, I am, live under my authority. And because we're all natural born sinners, we rebel and we reject that. Because you know why? No one's going to tell me how to live my life. Until God steps in and breaks you and says, yes, I will tell you how to live your life. And then that's the sweetest surrender of all. Amen? Amen. See, we have the ability now to tell people that there's a better kingdom to live under. There's better ethics and values to follow, and that has to do with the personal work of Jesus Christ. Because there's going to come a day when all people will be forced to acknowledge His sovereign Lordship. And there's no walking out of Jesus' commencement, just so you guys know. There will be the supernatural hand forcing those people to stay in their seats and say, what you dismissed, what you denied, what you rebelled against will no longer 
be turned away, you will know it. And for eternity, you will live under the kingship of Christ against your will. You'll acknowledge it, but you won't know the freedom of it. See, for those of us who know Jesus as king, there's celebration, right? Yes! The one we were broken under, the one we were mourning, the one we had pierced. I know I'm a sinner and I know what I did to Jesus and what sent him to the cross. It was me. But because of my brokenness, I found healing. That this world is not about Scott Morgan, that I am not the ultimate authority and there's a greater Lord than me and that is Jesus Christ, the sovereign, eternal, creative, absolute one. And I will live for eternity singing his praises because he conquered my heart here. But there will come a day when there are no second chances. There are no like, oh, but, 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 no. There will come a day we will celebrate God's reign, but there are going to be some who will not be a part of this kingdom joy. That's why in verse 16, he talks about the festival of booths that year after year, there's going to be people that worship the king, the Lord of hosts, to celebrate the feast of booths. This was the one festival that god's people celebrated that perhaps had the most amount of joy and celebration to it so zachariah says what festival has the most exuberance attached to it the festival of booths and he's saying that day after day you're going to go to a place where the sun does not matter the moon does not matter but jesus's brilliance will light up that place and you will be there and you will worship and you will have joy inexpressible because of Christ's conquering love in your heart on this side of eternity. This is good news. This is good news because right now, while we have life and breath, we can turn. This is a word to those of you who may not know Jesus yet, who, uh, who are still trying to live uh, following your own kingdom and your own lordship. Be broken before him. Today is the day of salvation. You are not God. Can you just turn to your neighbor and say, you're not God? You're not God. Humbling, isn't it? But there is one God who says, be broken before me, accept my love, and find healing and restoration for your life that you've never experienced before. Amen? (laughs) I'm, I'm the recipient of that, man. And I don't smoke weed. Imagine that. That's awesome. And then he says, to finish this out, verse 20, In that day there will be inscribed on the bells of the horses. Aw, there's going to be horses in heaven. Yay. Some of you are like, are there going to be animals in heaven? All animals except for cats. I'm sorry, but that's, that's what the Bible says. <laughs> I mean, even the, even the cartoons know, right? Like, all dogs go to heaven, and then the fall of all cats go to hell. You guys, you guys saw that cartoon? Oh, okay. So all the bells of the horses are inscribed holy to the Lord. And the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like the bowls before the altar. Basically, Zechariah is giving you a picture of this coming day when holiness will pervade all that God rules over. And in the meantime, holiness should pervade the lives of his people. Can I tell you that when God saves us, he saves us to set us on a course to pursue holiness in our lives. Can I tell you this is one of the toughest jobs as a pastor, is to encourage God's people on the path of holiness. Because sometimes we don't live holy lives. Sometimes we deliberately pursue unholy courses. But I'm going to tell you that what this points to us is that there's a future day and we're going to call it consummation of God's relationship. What is consummation? Well, it's this idea that it's like marriage. That there's an engagement period that's all designed to prepare us for the wedding day. And on that wedding day, we've prepared and now we get to experience all the preparedness that that we've been able to muster. And now that wedding day happens and God says, there's a wedding day coming. Him being the bridegroom and we are the bride, his church. We are to prepare ourselves for that day. And can I tell you, as a pastor, I've done hundreds of weddings. 
I've got the best seat in the house. I'm up there with the, the groom, and, you know, everyone's anticipating the arrival of the bride, right? Because no one else is important on that day other than the bride, right? Mother-in-law, mother, dad, you know, family members, great-great-grandma, Alice, not important. There's one person that's important, and it's that bride. And as soon as those doors open, it's like, whoosh, the glory is showing forth. I remember my wedding day, like, as soon as those doors opened, like, I was blinded for 10 minutes. I was like, is she here? Am, am I speaking to the, you know, the bride adorns herself, right? I have never known a bride who has gone into the wedding day with this, you know, half-ass attitude, right? Like, you know, I'll do my hair five minutes before. Uh, you know, I'll just get my dress on a couple minutes before the door. You know, she's getting all dolled up you know, like days before because she's anticipating that day. She's going to take care of herself. She's trying to lose weight. She's trying to look good, right? She's doing whatever she can to look good for her bridegroom. And what an apt picture for the church as we think about that day where Jesus is going to bring us home because it says it's going to be like a wedding. It's going to be the marriage feast, right? And God says, you as his church, anticipate that day and prepare yourselves. Can I ask you, how are you preparing yourselves for that, that wedding day? How are you preparing yourselves as far as living lives of holiness and living lives of godliness? Are you preparing for that day? Because I want you to know I am. I'm preparing because I can't wait. Because this world is not it. There's something better yet to come. And when he comes, I want to be found beautiful. I want to be found walking in righteousness. I want to be found where I say, thank you, God. I lived a life reflecting the grace and the love you've shown me. And I don't want to treat that trivially, and I don't want to treat it uh, haphazardly. I want to honor you, God, because I know that day is coming. And he's saying, prepare yourselves. Peter says this, 2 Peter chapter 3, You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. So Zechariah's words to us are these. Live lives of holiness. Prepare for his arrival. Because he's promised to come back. And guess what? That's a promise I'm going to believe in. And in the meantime, I'm going to live for his glory. I'm going to walk in holiness. And I'm going to glorify him in all I do and say. However imperfectly that is. But I'm going to trust him through it all. Amen? Jesus the wounded one. Jesus the cleansing one. Jesus the reigning one. Do we not serve an awesome God? Amen? So what has Zechariah told us? He told us three things, I believe. He told us that... Scripture is perfect. He has told us that Jesus is perfect, and he has told us that our salvation in him is perfect. What a message. Now we're going to dive into Malachi or Malachi, the Italian prophet, and that's going to be a lot of fun. So let's stand, let's pray, and then what we're going to do is we're going to go outside and be a part of some baptisms at 1030. I want to encourage you to stick around. Um, 10.30 sharp, it won't take long, but what an encouragement it will be for those getting baptized to have you be there as witnesses. So I love you guys. Thankful for you. I'm praying for you. Thank you for your prayers for me. And it's always good to, to gather around the truth of God, to hear his voice. And so, what's that? Have parents get their kids right away. Got it? taking my cues from my, my master over there. So, Father, you're awesome. Thank you for loving us the way you do. It blows our minds. It confounds us. It amazes us. That we know about ourselves. We know where our hearts are at. We come in here under the gravity and the weight of our own guilt and our own shame and and yet we hear a message like this where it seems hopeful. It seems like, yeah, perhaps that would work. Uh, my prayer is that this would just not remain in, as theory or just in our heads, but that the truths that we've talked about would transfer to our hearts. That you, God, who have promised 
that your truth will set us free, we would experience that. Lord, remind us that in Christ there is no condemnation for those who love you, who believe in you. Set us on a course towards joy and freedom and contentment and remind us that Jesus is all we need. Thank you for the message of Zechariah. The reminder that your promises can be trusted, your truth can be relied upon, and that we have a God who loves us through and through. Thank you for all that you've given us in Christ Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Hang out, grab some coffee. We'll gather on the patio about 1025, get started at 1030 sharp. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. God bless you guys.